Hey, Travis here. So this is my first garden update for 2023. So today is June the 24th, and I wanna show you what the garden's looking like, and I wanna talk about my new radical style of gardening. Check it out. So this is the corn patch. It's about 50 feet long by 25 feet wide. I've got seven rows of corn, and I've got 14 different varieties of field corn or dent corn all interplanted through this patch. So I'll tell you the reason I'm doing that in just a moment, but I wanna show you the evidence that will help you understand why I'm doing this. All right, so now I want you to check out the other half of the garden here. It's a little bit longer, maybe 70 feet long by that same 25 foot width. So check this out. Check out the cucumbers. So just check out the average height, maturity of the cucumbers. Check out the variability. So this is the beginning of my land race for the cucumbers. So I'm creating what's called a Grex, which is like um, a super hybridizing of many different varieties. So I've got maybe seven different varieties of cucumbers here. And my hope is that they will interbreed and I will produce my own variety that is genetically diverse, promiscuously pollinating, and vigorous, strong, and well adapted to my land, our pest, the soil, everything. Okay, so you get an idea of the size, the relative size, and maturity of these plants. Look at the tendrils. You know, the tendril is this here, and our current stock of cucumber genetics tends to have very weak tendrils because we grow the plant in a perfect controlled environment. So instead of changing the plants to be stronger, we always change the environment. Look at the tendril, just kind of reaching out into nowhere. You know, we do have some that hold on, you know, kind of, but for the most part, they're very limp-wristed, very lackluster, very lazy, you know? Until we get to the biggest, largest, strongest plant. And I know for a fact that this came from the seed I purchased from Joseph Lofthouse. So he created a land race variety and I know that this is the plant because look at this cucumber. It is kind of a pickling type cucumber that's got a lot of white in it. All the other cucumber varieties that I planted were the dark green slicing varieties, except for this one. And notice that it is the tallest plant by far. So again, it well, it's fast growing, and I'll explain that when we get to the winter squash, also by Joseph Lofthouse. But check out how the tendrils have a death grip on, I mean, this is this trellis netting. It's totally squishing it because of this vigorous grip. So let me explain why I think that this plant is performing differently. I mean, look how it holds on. Look how, I mean, it's just gripping incredibly effectively. So the way that Joseph Lofthouse grows his plants is like this. He starts off like I've done with several different varieties, tills up the soil, plants the seeds, and then that's about it. He lets them grow. He lets them struggle with the weed pressure, so he does very little weeding so the plants have to outcompete the weeds he does no fertilizing and he does no pest control so what happens is in the first season he gets a very high failure rate with his crops but he saves the seeds 
from the plants that survive so that the plant changes to match its environment so that we don't have to change the plant's environment. You see how powerful this is? Because if you are a new gardener and you're trying to learn about what's going wrong with your plants because they've got one disease or another or they're being attacked by one pest or another, all the advice that's given is some variation of how you change the plant's environment. Either change the soil, change the fertilization habit, use some pest control, either organic or synthetic, to kill the bugs. But this radical idea is let those plants die. Save the seeds from the plants that live. And in the next generation, you get a much more robust, powerful generation of plants that are specifically adapted to resist the bugs in your environment who can thrive given the soil that you have on your land. So what I'm showing you now, this is a Joseph Loft House land raised variety of winter squash. It has been extremely vigorous from the moment I planted it. I actually planted this two weeks after the cucumbers. And two weeks this time of year makes a big difference. I was going to thin it to about half this density. And I kept waiting for the, the plants to show a sign of stress before I thin them. They never did. And we've just had five days of continuous rain. You can see the, the tomatoes, some of the other plants, the watermelon are really struggling because they've just been drowning in water. They'll bounce back, I think, but I mean, nothing like this variety of winter squash. So this is a butternut type of squash. Let me tell you just a little bit more about Joseph Lofthouse. He grew this variety and he farms in Utah in a very cold climate at the base of a mountain range. And because his climate was so cold and his growing season was so short, he was never able to successfully grow many of the commercial varieties of vegetables that we love, like tomatoes, melon, squash, because they are hot climate varieties and they would never mature in time. So what he did is exactly what I'm replicating now. Start with many different varieties of, say, winter squash. Plant them all out together in a field with the hopes that they will interbreed. And whichever one happens to mature early in his narrow growing season, he would save the seeds from those that matured early and outcompeted the weeds and the pest and liked his environment well enough to produce seed. He would save those seeds, plant them next season, continue to do that. And by season three or so, the success rate went from, you know, 10, 20% to 80, 90% because the seed has the knowledge and the preferences that match the environment. So you're changing the plant to match the environment rather than changing the environment to match the plant. What's so radical is this is the way that food has been grown by humans forever. From the beginning of agriculture, this is how food was produced. And I thought about this for a long time since I started gardening. I thought about all the expense and all the inputs that are required now, I thought, to grow a successful garden. Like you've got to buy, you know, the trellising or the make the raised beds or even, you know, the fertilizer. You've got to have the fertilizer or the pesticides. And I thought, how did people ever grow food since all of these things are relatively new? Well, this is how. They, they changed the plant. They didn't change the environment. And this is how people have always grown food until less than a century ago. You know, somewhere between 50 and 100 years. But it's just long enough that our grandparents forgot it, which means it's out of 
it's it's fallen out of the oral tradition. See this cucumber plant, the landrace variety, that's twice as vigorous as all the other competitors. Reminds me of a breed of dog called a Belgian Malinois. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's like a German Shepherd, but with more drive, more intensity, more vigor. And um, I train dogs and I raised a Belgian Malinois from an eight week old puppy. And it was like nothing I'd ever experienced. I've, I've trained many puppies and dogs, but this puppy would just sit and just stare at me for a piece of kibble indefinitely indefinitely for five minutes just stare lock eye contact and just look for direction um from eight weeks old and they natural they're protection dogs like german shepherds they're used in the military and the police historically they have been in as protection dogs so they're also bred to bite and from <laughs> four week old puppies you know, you put a shirt in there and they're just hanging from the shirt, just bite, hanging onto it. And that's in their genetics. And the way that they've become so intense is because in Europe, in Belgium, where they're bred, they were very strict about the breeding protocol so that every single dog that was bred passed a test. And it could be like a ring sport, French ring, Belgian ring, Mondio ring, Schutzen. But they passed a test and that could include things like they've got to jump over a seven foot wall. It's a wooden wall, no supports or anything. They've got to clear a seven foot wall. They have to run at full speed and attack a man screaming with a stick, hitting them with a stick. So they have this ferocity this courage, this heart, this physical integ integrity, because if the dog has a hip problem, they can't jump over a fence like that. You have to have the, it, you don't have to breed them like a show dog by physically evaluating their structure. You put them through a physical test and in order to pass the physical test, they must have a sound structure. But all this is to say, like, the breeding for intensity and vigor is powerful. It's very powerful. And I'm absolutely convinced now that I've seen the, the behavior of these plants that I'm going to be growing more in a land race style. So, like, check out this area. Directly behind my current garden will be dedicated to land race gardening next season. So I'll till up an area and dedicate some space to maybe my winter squash, some other space to a watermelon breeding project and really let the plants fend for themselves and get that really strong genetics that don't require any coddling or inputs. All right, let's take this analogy one step further. So we've got first the land race plant is compared to the Belgian Malinois, which is a very intense, driven, almost wild game bred dog. So we've got that. And then we compare all our other varieties of plants in the garden, like the heirloom variety, is like any other domesticated dog breed. So it could be Chihuahua, a Poodle, a Golden Retriever. And it's similar in this way. So an heirloom variety is basically a plant that was bred long ago and far away, and it's been inbred ever since. So it was basically a land race 50 or so years ago that was perfectly adapted for that farm, wherever it is in the country or the world. And then it's just been intensely inbred so that whenever you save the seed from that plant, the children looks the same, look the same as the parent. So if you have a golden retriever, you have two golden retriever parents, the children, the puppies will be golden retrievers and they'll look the same. But what do we know about our domesticated dogs? If you're not extremely careful with the breeding, each breed starts to develop um, genetic traits that cause disease. And that's called inbreeding depression. So that's what we have going on with most of our plants that we use in agriculture, in the garden is a lot of inbreeding depression. 
weak plants that have lost their genetic memory about how to respond to the environment. And then you're being sold the solution to this problem in the form of hybrids, or even for on the commercial scale, you have the genetically modified seed. But the hybrid would be most common for the gardener. And all that is, is two different inbred heirloom varieties that are bred together to produce a hybrid variety, a mix of those two heirloom varieties. And that hybrid variety has hybrid vigor, which just means it's less inbred than the two parents, right? And it experiences that vigor. But then if you save that seed, it doesn't, the, the offspring don't immediately have that same vigor. And um, you have an inconsistent result and people become dependent on going back to the seed company year after year to buy their hybrids. And it also creates this idea that you can't save seeds. But we absolutely can save our own seeds. We just have to reintroduce as much genetic variability as possible when we start. Because again, a lot of those commercial seed lines have become intensely inbred. And in that process, they've become forgetful and they no longer know how to respond to the pest in the environment, blight, drought, and all the things that they have to face in an ever-changing environment. So by reintroducing those diverse genetics, they have a broad toolkit to select from when they face a new problem. By reintroducing that wide variety of genetics, we're reintroducing that genetic memory into our seed line in that toolkit of various ways to respond to an ever-changing environment. And the result we get is a plant that is a organism whose memory is up to date and current with its ever-changing environment. You know, its memory isn't frozen back 50 years ago in a far away farm and 50 years in the past, and then the environment is changing. You know, we want our plants to have a memory that is current with its environment today. And that's what you can do when you breed your own plants, save your own seeds in this way. So do the most radical thing possible and grow food the way we always have.